All right, guys, so for those of you that haven't seen the emails or didn't know, we have with us some great people tonight. We have a Thank you. <laughs> senior who is graduating, Caroline. I already graduated, and Andrew from Novi High School. They were a big part of the youth group over the last couple of years. And their former youth minister, too, Caitlin's here with us, so that's awesome. Um, but with us, too, is J.R. Holden, right? So I've shown you guys some of the, some of you guys the uh, book that he wrote. And um, so you guys saw some of the pictures of him playing against Team USA in the Olympics and hitting the game-winning shot. We, we can play it later if we want. The uh, YouTube clip. Was, was, that, was that over Calderon? Yeah. Okay. Jose Calderon. And uh, Paul, Paul Gasol was on that team, too. So uh, it's just really cool to have him here. And, uh, we'll see in a little bit. But um, so please give him your attention. And like you said, uh, after he gets done speaking, he had a couple of points that he wants to cover tonight. But after that, it's free, open question, and you guys can ask him if you want or stay a little bit later and ask him some questions too. So, uh, everybody, give it up for Jared Holden. I won't. I won't bore you with everything about me. So I'll get to the the good parts at least for the, the younger guys. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, just like most of you, I grew up in the church. Um, I didn't grow up Catholic, but I did grow up Christian, and I believe in the Holy Trinity, just like you guys, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I came to talk to you definitely about the fun stuff and the basketball and being successful and playing in the Olympics, but I also came to talk came to talk to you a little bit about your faith. And I'll start there with that because when you become successful, one of the things that is very hard to really talk about is your faith. Because when you get in front of a lot of people, they want to hear the good stuff. Nobody wants to hear that, you know what, no matter what, I believed in God. You know, when I was alone and I was thousands of miles away from home and I didn't have my mom or my, fa or my father or my brother or my sister, I only really had one person that I really could lean on that I could trust. And that was, that was God. That's one person that no matter what you're going through in life, no matter how good or bad anything is, you'll always be able to get on your knees and pray. You'll always be able to open the Bible and read. God will never leave you, no matter what. So being able to speak to you guys, and especially because you all are Catholic and you all are into, into your spirituality, that was it's like an honor for me to be able to speak about that because you really don't get to. It's a thing where it's not, quote, unquote, the cool thing. You know, you're... People ask me, they say, well, how was it to play against Kobe? Nobody says, well, how did you ever get there? You know, did you have a, did you have an undying faith? Did you really believe? Uh, how'd you go from going to a small school like Bucknell University to playing in the Olympics? No one from my school ever played in the NBA. Nobody from my school at that time had played overseas. I was the first. And for you guys, I got to ask you guys. I asked, you said you wanted to be a professional baseball player, correct? Professional hockey. And one of the things I would tell you right now is to dream big. If you have God, you really can dream big. It's, it's an unbelievable experience if you can dream big. Most times you put limitations on yourself. Somebody might tell you right now, you won't make it. You'll be a good college player. It's okay because they don't know how hard you're going to work. They don't know that you have someone that will never let you down. Even your mom or your dad, they might be like, oh, you lost. And they really won't understand sometimes what you're going through. But there is one person that, uh, that does. Uh, he already has, it, has already had it planned out for you. You want to play professional hockey, you'll be a professional hockey player. You know that? You really don't believe that right now, but I bet you when you turn 11, 14, 17, how old are you now? 11. 11. See, when you turn 13, 15, 17, you'll, 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 be, you'll feel overjoyed at the accomplishments that you'll, that you'll have. And one of the reasons why I know that, because you played that very competitive. You were like, I got to get JR out. I got to get JR out. You picked me out of everybody else. Like, I'm going to get you out first. And that's a part of being great. I hope you all know that you have to work hard. It's one thing that I don't care if you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, anything you want to be, you have to work hard. I, I tell you that because I have a friend, and I wouldn't say he was a friend that I grew up with. He was a friend overseas, and he was a doctor. And I asked him, why are you overseas in Russia? And he said, I had a dream of owning my own hospital, but I never could own it in the United States. Well, you know where I went to get my physical every year? You know where I went when I got a cold? This was an American who owned a hospital in Russia. So to tell me that your dreams can't come true, it's impossible. It's bigger than basketball. It's bigger than a sport. It's whatever you want to do. And this was a man that said, I want to own my own hospital. And in the States, I kept getting denied. But my dream was to own a hospital. And I wasn't going to stop. And if it had to me.
to take me overseas or to take me to another country, that's what I was going to do. And he accomplished it. So I'm a real believer in you can accomplish anything you want to do as long as you are open to saying, I'm going to do it at all costs. Another thing I want to talk to you about is the hardest thing, you know, he sent me a list of five questions. And he said, what was the, what's the most fun thing about being a professional? And it's kind of a double-edged sword for me because you don't want to say money, even though money was a big part of the fun part. But for me, it was the money because I was able to give back. Um, you know, one thing I've always wanted to be able to do is give back to my parents. And I was able to, to do that. Um, I was able to give out 23 scholarships to kids like you that were going to college. So those are things that I cherish the most. Why, while I love talking about the Olympics with you and I love talking basketball, I love talking about being able to help others. Because I know I wouldn't be here without the help of a lot of people that supported me. Whether it was my mom, whether it was someone I shouldn't have been hanging around telling me to stay out the streets, whether it was somebody, whether it was a teacher saying, I know you can do better than a C. Everybody played a part in helping me get to where I'm at. And I hope you guys do understand that, is that I want you, whether it's your mom, your grandma, your dad, to thank them each and every day for one thing that they did for you. Because that's something that you're, you don't really get to do because you just take it for granted. That I take for granted that I was going to eat every meal, a meal every day. I took for granted that my mom had to cook and to go get groceries and do all those things. We just take for granted because that's just a part of our everyday life. But going overseas and get to experience other people that are 11 that are really living out on the street, that are 13 and they're just begging for change on a corner, you're always saying like, wow, my, my mom didn't have me doing that. My parents made sure that I was taken care of and that I at least had the basic necessities. So if that's one thing I want you guys to do today is when you go home, you just thank your parents to give them a hug and just say, I love you. Because that's something that they'll never forget when you're 19 and you're too cool to give your mom a hug. They'll remember you were 11 and you came home one day and was like, mom, I love you. Just for no reason. She didn't have to buy you a new Xbox game or a new PlayStation game. Just, she just gave you, I mean, you just felt like, you know what, mom, I want to tell you I love you. I would say the most difficult thing about being overseas was being away from family and friends. I think, you know, when you say you have a dream, I didn't go over and I didn't go over as this guy as a superstar. I went over as a guy going overseas to make $2,500 a month. So it wasn't that I went overseas and they were like, hey, come over, we'll give you $500,000, we'll give you a million dollars. I came over for $2,500 a month, less than probably everybody in here makes. But it was my dream. I had a dream and my dream was to play professional basketball. I didn't know how I would get there. And the crazy story is how I got there is that I didn't have an agent, I didn't have anybody that wanted me. I filled out this piece of paper on a good friend of mine's desk. He was a college coach. His name is Darrell Porter. And he was at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There was a sheet that said, who wants to play professional basketball? Now, I'm sure millions of kids have filled this out. So to this day, I don't know if that's the reason I got the car or not. But I filled out the sheet. And two weeks later, a guy called me from Finland. His name is Ron and I stay in touch with him to this day. And actually, I gave his son, who graduated from college, $50,000. And I did that for one reason only. Not because it was about the amount of money, but if this man didn't call me and take a chance on me, I would have never been able to take care of my family. I would have never been able to do the special things. Now, having a real job get, by making my no mistake is that a bad thing. But it wasn't my dream. My dream wasn't to be a businessman. My dream wasn't to be a doctor. My dream was to be a basketball player. And this man from Finland named Raonu gave me a call and said, do you have a passport? I said, yes. He said, how about you come overseas for $400 to a country called Riga Latvia? You probably never heard of it because I've never heard of it. <laughs> and he said, come overseas for one week, and if you make the team, you can stay. I went over for four days. I got to play, and I played with another guy named Dan Kreft from Northwestern University. And he was over there, too, and he had had a guaranteed contract. And to tell you how God works is they wanted to keep us both, but they didn't have the money to keep us both, so one of us had to go. And this guy is seven feet tall, everything that I thought they wanted, but after my week, they sent him home and kept me. So to tell you that, when people say, well, how do you believe in God, or how do you have this unshakable, I think my faith has grown each level and each step I've went in my life. And I think it grows because the more successful you get, the more things you accomplish, especially in high school, you're going to have different people and different hurdles and obstacles to go through. I know in high school, for me, the cool thing was to drink. That was the cool thing. And I'm not saying I'm the innocent one because I have had a drink before, so I'm not going to sit here and lie to you guys. But I do know this, that I know that God had me covered no matter what. 
he was the one person I could go to and say, and say, when I couldn't go to my mom and say, I was drinking and I feel bad, I know I could go to him and say, God, I know this is not what I'm not supposed to be doing. Whatever I'm supposed to be doing, can you help lead me in the right direction? And for some reason, I named my book Blessed Footsteps because I really do believe that. I believe that God truly said, look, this is the way you're going to go. It's not going to be easy. It's not always going to be fun. It's not always going to be the things that you want to do. But I guarantee you, if you never, never, never lose sight and lose faith in me, I'll take you to places you never imagined. And he's done it. Uh, life lessons. One thing I would, you know, life lessons I would tell you, I told you from the beginning, hard work. Um, you know, you're younger right now, so it's really hard, but for the high school graduates, what are you, what are you going to school for? Probably business. Probably business. Uh, medical field. Medical field. Medical field, okay. Um, it's definitely for you. One of the things I say, I think that separates a lot of people when it gets to that next level of being in the top tier of your class is hard work. And I thought I was working hard, I'm not gonna lie to you. I met a guy who said, his name is Jerome Brown, don't know this man from the can of paint. He said, you, you wanna be a pro, right? I said, yes. He said, are you working hard? I said, yes. He said, what time do you get up? He said, seven o'clock. What time do you get to the gym? I said, eight o'clock. He said, how many other people probably do that? I said, I don't know. He said, millions. He said, how about you get up at four o'clock, get to the gym at five o'clock, work out, then go eat your breakfast, and then come back to the gym while your whole team is in the gym, and then tell me how, and then tell me that you want to be a pro. So to me, I'm saying, whatever you guys do, you're going to have to work a little bit harder than the next person. And I don't know what your sacrifice may be. Your sacrifice might be you have to stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning and, and sleep and only get three or four hours of sleep. But I do believe to be special at whatever you want to do, you have to put in the work. It's unavoidable. If you want to be a good businessman, that's what's going to separate you. I want to do business with someone that I think is going to work just as hard or harder than me. I don't want to do with some, a business with someone that's lazy or they know someone that knows someone that knows someone that can handle my money. I'm doing it with you. So the same in the medical field. I want to go to a doctor that's good. I know you got to get your sleep, though, because I don't want you operating on me and have <laughs> sleep. But you know what I mean? I just think you have to put in that extra work to be elite. So I think hard work is really, is really key. The second thing I will say about a life lesson about traveling the world, and definitely for the younger kids, is be open to meeting new people. Be open to people that aren't like you. Everybody's not going to come from the same background as you. Everybody's not going to have all the things you have. But one thing I would want you all to try to do, especially when you go to school, is to kind of befriend someone that's not, that's, that's not the cool kid. That's not the kid that plays baseball. And I say that because when you get to travel and meet different people, you don't know what you're missing in that person unless you give them a try. I, went to, I was going to places that we didn't even speak the same language. And for the first two, three years of my career, I had my headphones on and my head down. And I can honestly say I missed three years of meeting a lot of good people. Because when I took my headphones off and actually said, hey, how you doing? They tried to speak English. They tried to teach me in, in Belgium, they speak Dutch and Flemish. They tried to teach me their language because I was open to getting to know them and they were open to getting to know me. And I would say for you guys, you don't know that friend that he really just needs somebody to say, hey, how you doing today? That matters. And it means a lot to people that aren't the cool kid. Because I always thought I was the cool kid. And when you meet someone that's not, you get a different type of respect for the next person. And when you respect people to the utmost, you'll never realize that happiness starts within. You know, people will say money makes you happy, it doesn't. You know, friends make you happy, it doesn't. If you're happy with yourself, the outside world becomes everybody's cool. When I'm happy, I'm like, hey, how you doing? I don't know your name, but it's good to meet you today. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? And people, they open up to you. They're like, man, he's a, he's a nice guy. He's a good guy. And in this world where everybody is so, to me, a little bit cutthroat, I think it's important to be open to, to different people. And because you're so young, I think it's even more important for you guys to be open and, to, and be willing to meet a lot of different people. The last thing I wanted to leave you with, and this is not for you guys, but for you, is when you guys are good at, all of you guys seem like all-stars, the way you talk to me. How about all of you help someone get as good as you? Because along the way, you're going to need help because somebody's going to help you become better. There's a kid on your team because I was the worst at it, and that's why I'm speaking to you specifically, is that we're so competitive. 
and that kid that strikes out and is the last out of the game, you know what you're saying? That kid sucks. And it's good. I've done it. So you don't have to act innocent here. Or I don't know why he's on our team. And I think it's important because you're so young and you're going to need so much help to get, become a college player, to become a high school player, to become a pro player. Because I think all of you can do it. I think you guys have to take the time to maybe work with someone else that is a little less than you. I know there's a kid on your team that's probably not a very good baseball player. You said it today. I think you said this is your first year playing basketball. You're going to need someone to say, hey, what did I tell you? I'll go out there and work with you. Well, how about you take someone younger than you, one of these guys, or someone younger than you and say, hey, I'll come help you work on your baseball game. Because I think it's important that as we go up, that we don't forget the people that are behind us that may not be as talented as us. So that's basically my spiel. So any questions? You can ask me anything under the sun. I didn't talk about basketball, all, those, all that stuff, because I believe you'll ask those questions. But if you want me to, I will. You guys got? Can you talk about basketball? Yeah. <laughs> oh, talk about basketball. Um, I started in Latvia. I spent one year in Latvia, and I came home. And after Latvia, I made twenty-five thousand dollars for the year. And I said, I'm not going back overseas for twenty-five thousand dollars. I'm just not doing it. And a team from Belgium in Ostende, I sent up teams in Ostende, Belgium. It's on the beach, and they called me and they said, We'll give you a contract for five thousand five hundred a month. I was running to the plane. I don't mean walking, I was running to the plane like, when do I leave? So I went from Latvia to Belgium. I spent two years in Belgium. And Belgium is the only year I ever lost a championship that I was overseas. I spent 13 years overseas, I won 12 championships. I lost one year and I lost my first year in uh, Belgium. I went from Belgium to a country called Greece. I went to, I played in Athens, Greece for a year. And then I spent nine years in Russia. The owner of the Brooklyn Nets, Mikhail Prokhorov, was my owner at Seska Moscow. So he was always planning on buying a team in the United States. So I lived in luxury overseas in Russia because it was like playing on an NBA team in New York. I had two offers to play in the NBA. Um, I got an offer from the Los Angeles Clippers when I was 28 years old for a one-year deal for the league minimum. And again, to show you how God works, I had an offer for one year, and in my mind, I was like, man, I get to come back home. My family gets to see me play. And the owner, Mikhail Prokhorov, says, whatever they offer you, I'll give you double the stay. So I never left. I didn't, I didn't take the contract. I was like, at that point in my career, it was less important for me to, quote unquote, play in the NBA than it was to, be, to play and be the best I could possibly be in Europe. And that's another thing I would want to tell you. Embrace your moment, embrace your situation. Don't look for what's going to happen two years from now because you don't know what's going to happen two years from now. A lot of us say, I'm going to do this now because this is going to happen later. Well, that's what I thought too. I'm going to be in the NBA one day. And I never played in the NBA, and it wasn't because I couldn't. It was by my choice. The second time I had an offer, I was 31 years old. We had just won the 2007 Euro, uh, European Championship, Russia's only gold medal ever. We beat Spain and Paul Gasol and Marc Gasol and Jose Calderon and Ricky Rubio. Those guys were on that team. Um, Memphis Grizzlies. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't know who your heroes are or legends of hockey, but uh, Jerry West called me on the phone. And I don't know if any of you know who Jerry West is. He's the emblem of the NBA. Yeah. And this guy calls me. He's like, JR, this is Jerry West. And I'm thinking it's my friends playing with me. I'm like, I'm not going to lie. I said a curse word. And I was like, are you serious, man? Quit playing with me. He's like, JR, this is Jerry West. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, whatever, okay. He's like, seriously, I'll call you back in five minutes. So I really thought he was joking, I thought it was a friend. Jerry West calls me back in five minutes, he says, I have a one year offer for you to come to the Memphis Grizzlies. You have 24 hours to make your decision. And two minutes, flat, I called Mikhail Prokhorov, I told him I wanted to take this deal, I was 31, I knew this might be my last opportunity to play in the NBA. He said, how about, I triple your salary and give you a three-year deal. So I never left. <laughs> and I finished my career in Russia. Um, I didn't retire because I had to. I didn't retire because I was an injury. I just retired because I have a daughter here in Michigan. That's why I'm in Michigan. I have a fiance here in Michigan. And at the time, I told my daughter that, and that's one of the reasons why I started writing a book. I said that once she started school, I would quit playing. Because I could chase money forever. I have a Russian passport, which I'll tell you about how I got the Russian passport. And at that time, I made a promise. And I felt like God had gave me, given me everything I've ever asked for more, that the least I can do is stick to my word. So I stuck to my word. Um, the Russian passport is another thing. Is 
I was playing overseas in Russia, I think it was my second year, and our owner is Mikhail Prokhorov, but the president, his name is Sergei Kushenka. And the Russian national team hadn't won a gold medal in the European Championship ever since they had become Russia, because they used to be the USSR, which is the Soviet Union. They have now been Russian. They had never won a gold medal. And the weakest position was point guard. So the guy, I thought he was joking because, of course, you know, I'm black. All Russians are white. Why would they pick me to be on the Russian national team? I thought it was a joke. So he's like, no, we need a point guard. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll call you and we'll see if we can do it. So in order to get a passport overseas, you either have to be married to a Russian or the president of the country has to stamp you off as a Russian citizen. And the country's president is Putin, who probably you kind of don't know or don't like, one or two, but he's the president. And our president, Sergei Kushenka, said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. So no lie, 9 o'clock in the morning in Russia, we're eight hours in front of you here in the States. So 9 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from Sergei Kushenka. There'll be a black car outside waiting for you in 20 minutes. I get in a black car, don't know where I'm going, but the president team said to go, I'm going. I go to the Russian embassy. Remind you, at this time, I don't speak any Russian. I go to the Russian embassy. I take a picture. They say, go to the car. We'll bring your passport. I go to the car. They drive me to the Russian embassy. And I'm at the embassy now. And um, Sergei Kushenka meets me there. And President Putin calls me, calls Kushenka on the cell phone. Now, I'm really nervous. I don't know about y'all, but you know, I'm in Russia. I'm black. I'm a little uncomfortable. I'm in black SUVs. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going on. And literally says hello. His English is not very good at the time. Maybe it's a little better now. It wasn't very good. He says, I want you to represent my country well, and I'll be watching. That's it. Not hello, not how are you, not anything. Just represent my country well. Here goes your passport. You better help us win. That's how I got the passport. Um, the first year I got the passport, and this is for you guys that always think success is, the first time I got the passport, we played in Serbia, and we didn't win. It was the European Championships of 2005, and we just didn't play well. As a team, I didn't think I played well as a person, and it's one of those things where sometimes you gotta get knocked down in order to really focus on where you wanna go. Um, in 2005, we lost, and actually the team we won it all was a team from Greece. And one of, the team, one of the players on that team was a teammate of mine. And his name is Theodorus Papaloukas. He's a legend over in Greece. But in, five, in 2005, we lost. In 2006, I didn't want to play. I just didn't feel like it was a good fit. And I didn't speak Russian. And just it was just an uncomfortable situation. But again, how God works, guess who became a coach? An English person. A guy from America named David Black, who was born in Boston, but grew up in Israel. He becomes the new coach of the Russian national team. It became so much easier for me. And we go on in 2006. We end up in first place in 2007. We win the European Championship in 2008. I got to play in the Olympics. Now, I know you guys want to know about Kobe Bryant, Chris Paul, Deron Williams, LeBron James. I'll give you guys everything you want to know. Um, I went to lunch with LeBron James, really cool guy. Um, I don't know about you guys, but usually when guys are at that level, they don't invite you to lunch. Well, I'm in the hotel, he's in the hotel, I'm getting out the elevator, he's like, JR, come to lunch with me, I don't wanna eat by myself. I don't know LeBron James, but I said, cool, I'll go with you to eat lunch, like why not? So he's a really, he's out of all the players on the team, I can honestly say he was probably the most down to earth. To be the superstar that he is, or the global icon that he is, he was probably the most down to earth. We talked rap music, we talked Maroon 5, Coldplay, we talked everything. He's just a real cool guy, he doesn't have 50 million people around him like most of the superstars do. Um, he's just, he was really, he was really nice. As far as on the basketball court, he's huge. Like, he's four of me, six, eight, and runs just as fast as, who's the fastest kid here? Oh, no hands go up. Who's the fast? Oh, now your hands go up. He runs as fast as you, and he's three times, he's six, eight, 270 pounds. And he really does run that fast, like, really. Um, you can you Google or YouTube highlights, you'll see me running and you'll see LeBron right behind me and he's ridiculously bigger than me. So it's pretty, how he's, he's a, basically a freak of nature as far as his being that big. Um, 
most of the guys, and this is why I say you guys can become anything you want, most of the guys weren't amazing to me. They weren't, I, I thought, it was uncomfortable at first that I'm running out and I'm an American, I have Russia on my chest, and I'm seeing them and all they have is USA. And at first we didn't communicate. You know, we didn't really say too much to each other because maybe because I was an American representing another country. So it was a little friction at first because we weren't in Shanghai, we weren't even in Beijing yet at the Olympics. And um, we had played them and it was just a little uncomfortable because I would have thought that we're all from America. It's just, hey, how you doing? You know, we're about the competition. It is what it is. But it wasn't like that. It was strictly business for them. So it became strictly business for me. And I wasn't overly impressed. Uh, Chris Paul is a good player. I wouldn't say I was amazed. I would say he was good. I would say Carmelo Anthony, I told you guys, was probably the most astonishing for me because he was bigger than LeBron. But he just scored so easy. And to me, I was just like, wow. Imagine having to guard him 82 games, uh, 82 nights in the season. So you really can, you know, for especially for you young guys, and even, even for you high school guys, you really can be whatever you want to be. I thought, I went to Buckingham, how can I compete with LeBron James? I went to this, I, mean, I grew up in a small little borough of Pittsburgh called Wilkesburg. How can I be on the court with these guys? At some point, I realized that I was just as good as them. And all I had to do was just play and do what I do best, and that's just play basketball. The game winner. Yeah, I was, I was going to play that clip. Okay. How was it living in Olympic Village? It was, you know, it's, it's amazing how you see, like, I went to see Michael Phelps. And I was going to ask that as well. It's, it's amazing where you have so much admiration and respect for what, it's the best in the world at everything. So you're walking down and you run into Michael Phelps, you run into Samantha Williams, you run, and you're looking at them in amazement, and they're looking at you in amazement. They're like, wow, you're playing on the Russian team. And you're like, wow, you're going about to win like 20 gold medals, Michael Phelps. This is crazy. And everybody is just, everybody's friendly. It's not, and maybe because everybody's an athlete, and maybe because everybody, but I was in awe of Mike Phelps. I was so in awe of him, I didn't even get his autograph. Like, I felt uncomfortable because nobody else was asking for it. I didn't want to seem like the weirdo. I was like, Yo, that's Michael Phelps. Do you understand who that is? That's Michael Phelps. And he just kept winning medal after medal after medal, and I felt bad. Um, crazy story. Who's the guy from Jamaica? The fast runner, the fastest guy in the world. Usain Bolt. No lie to you. In the Olympic Village, you have a cafeteria, like regular cafeteria food, and then there's one McDonald's. That's it in the Olympic Village. The day before his race, Usain Bolt is at McDonald's, hanging out, eating Big Macs, Fries, no lie, just sitting down on the thing, on the counter like this, just eating McDonald's. The fastest guy in the world. So I didn't know who he was. I'm like, who's this clown? Because I didn't know who he was. I'm like, he's eating burgers before his race. He, he runs Olympic, the fastest time ever. At so fast. yeah, I was like, I couldn't believe it. He's eating McDonald's before, before his race. That's so funny. it's crazy. Here's that clip, guys. This was the 2007, right? Yes. Okay. You talk us through it. Power Soul took a shot um, from about 
16 feet, just missed it. Oh. I got a good shot. Um, the play before that, I had got a steal from Power Soul. So that's how that set up the shot. We didn't call a timeout after the steal. We just went with it. For me, um, when I say the play wasn't for me, I looked to Karolinko first because most people know he's the NBA player and he's like the famous guy in Russia. And for myself, I felt like he had played a good game and he deserved to ask, you know, to get the ball if he wanted it. But he waved it off. He was just like, no, he didn't want it. So okay. I'm not saying that he was didn't want it, like because he was nervous, but yeah. he, just didn't, didn't, he was in a position to take a good shot. How did they wave it off? I mean, did they physically show you? Well, I was, or was it more just like, remember when I was just dribbling out yeah. front? I was looking at him to see uh -huh. what he wanted to do if he was going to pop on either side. And he just was like, just wave like up. Oh, OK. What was your question? Um, when you were, uh, when that guy was facing you, when you were about to uh, dodge him and take your shot, what were you thinking? I better make this shot because I got to go back to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, um, one of the things I, I do as a basketball player when I work out, one thing I'm going to give him for your arms, I try to pick um, certain spots that I feel like if I get, I'll never miss. And I know going right anywhere around the free throw line, on both sides, if I can create enough space, I should miss. Because I feel like I take that shot millions of times working out, millions of times in the gym. And if you do repetition, it's no different than hitting a hockey puck. If you do it, you know, if you get to your spot, you're like, oh, I'm going to make it. So I felt like if I got to the right spot, I would make it. Now, you know, got a little bit of a lucky roll, of course, but I felt like if I got to a good spot on the court, I could make the shot. Where's the one with uh, LeBron that you were saying that, like, the do you, do you, would you I see it yeah, at first glance or probably not? No, I don't. Is there any other one that would be that would make sense to watch real quick or? No, because I don't. Honestly, I don't do the YouTube thing. Okay. <laughs> so all that stuff, I don't know. Look at that, Jared Holden playing with heart. Let's see, playing with heart.
didn't. I didn't go back. For the one that's so cheap, uh, I didn't go back to the Olympics. Um, what did you ask me? Um, what was your best game? Um, that's hard. I don't, I don't know if I remember probably my best game. I think I had a lot of very good games. I, probably my best games were the ones I didn't score a lot, just because you have to do so much other stuff for the team. But as an American, I was telling him, as an American, usually when you go overseas, you're asked to be more to the team. Um, at Russia, in Russia, it was a little different because I got to play with, um, I was the only probably player on my team um, probably the last two years that had never played in the game. So half of the Russians that were on the team had played in the NBA. Sergey Monia played in the NBA, Victor Kriapa, Andre Kirilenko, as you know. So uh, Victor Alexander played in the NBA. Trajan Langdon was my teammate who went to Duke and spent uh, was the number 13 draft pick in the NBA, spent three years with the Cavs. So for the last two years, I was probably the only non-NBA player on my team. Yeah. Any aspirations to coach in the future? Or? You want to get a job? No, I'm <laughs> um, I don't know. Honestly, uh, uh, two years ago, I tried to buy a team in Belgium. They wanted a little bit more than I wanted to give for the team. Um, I, I really wanted to do something that was blending America and Belgium just because I know what it takes because I did it in Russia. Yeah. And I know that most times uh, they just see it as just going to get to Americans if they play basketball and send them home. Sure. What I wanted to do is something where like, they can go to the university as well. So you can get kids, you bring them to the university, let them go to school, and then you bring them on to your team. So it's kind of like home, you know, like school away from home. Right. The way kids come from different countries and go to school here, I kind of want to do that in Belgium. Who was your, who was your best player that you like played with on the team, Carolingo? Honestly, he was the most athletic. He's he's another special guy. Um, my probably my best teammate though was probably Trajan Langdon because uh, he knows probably better than most of us how it is to be at the top. He went to Duke, played the national championship. He was number thirteen in the draft. Like one, two, three, he was thirteen. And he played three years in the NBA, and that was it. Like, he no longer could play in the NBA. So he knew what it was to be at the top and kind of to fall, because nobody's dream is to go to York, and that wasn't his. So to end up there and just to be considered just an okay basketball player, I felt like he was one of those guys that knew what it took to be successful and was willing to work the hour. Um, have you ever uh, regret not taking him off for You know what? No, I never. Uh, I never look back when I made the decisions. Um, I think I was lucky because I got to play not just with my club team throughout the year, but I got to play against Tony. Like we beat Tony Parker in 2007 as well. We beat uh, Saruna Zesikavich and Linus Klaza, who are Lithuanian. They played for their national team. So I got to play against a whole bunch of NBA players. So I never doubted myself. It's like, can I play in the NBA? Yeah, I know I can play in the NBA. So I felt like I didn't have anything to prove to myself as far as like, oh, I have to take this offer. But if I didn't, I probably would have. I probably would have said, I never know if I can play against the best of the best because I never done it, but I got a chance to. A couple more questions, go ahead. What was your highest scoring game and most assist game? Uh, my highest scoring, I think, was 40 points. Mm -hmm. And my highest assist, I think, was 13. What was your favorite country to live in and why? That's an adult question, but um, I'll say my favorite country, uh, country to live in, um, I would say Belgium. And I say Belgium because it was probably the, the place where I felt the most at home. Um, you can go to France, you can go to Germany, and you can go to Holland in driving within two hours. So it's one of those places where it's the center, but if you want like, you can drive two hours, you can be in Paris. You can drive two hours, you can be in Germany. You can drive two hours, you can be in Holland. And of course, Holland is like America. Everybody speaks English. You can go to a barber shop. Like everything was normal. Everybody speaks English. So, and it's a mix. Um, when you go into Belgium, if you go to any major city, Antwerp, Brussels, um, even Ostende, and maybe even Hassel, a, a smaller thing, but it's near the city of Brussels, you see a mix of everything. You see people from Caribbean, from the Caribbean. You see people from Jamaica. You see people from Africa. And their university, I think they hold 42 different nationalities at the Brussels University. So you really do get a mix of everybody. So English is your, you know, your language of, of choice. Well, you know, language for everybody. So I felt like that was probably the most comfortable I lived. So I like that the best. Are you a good three-point shooter? You know what? I'm not gonna lie to you. I think I was a streaky shooter. 
Um, I wouldn't say I was the most consistent, but um, I would say I, I really never missed big shots. Like, I might miss shots throughout the game, but usually when it matters most, I usually make them. So, let me knock on wood, I want to keep it, even though I don't play. <laughs> What are your plans now? Um, I really don't know. I think I would like to get into scouting in the NBA. Um, I don't know how hard it'll be because I don't have an NBA resume and all those things. So what I've started is um, I've talked to my financial advisor because he works with a lot of NBA players. And I'm thinking of kind of doing it how I did my career, starting my own scouting service and starting with scouting kids here in Michigan and scouting kids in York. So instead of doing it like everybody else does it, go recruit the best players. I want to scout players that are like me, the best of the unknown, so that schools in the South, schools out West, they don't, especially the university, they don't have the money to recruit. But how about I can kind of recruit for them? So I build my own credibility and my own resume so that now the NBA can say, well, what have you done? Well, I've been scouting. I've been doing a job you couldn't do because you don't have the time and that wasn't what you were looking for. So I scouted him, let's just say, and he becomes a Division One basketball player. Well, I knew he had the potential, they didn't, and now a school in California can now recruit him. It doesn't have to be closed-minded to Michigan kids go to Michigan, or Pennsylvania kids stay in, stay in state, especially if they aren't enough. Because now it's always the top player gets all the recruiting, and the unknown players who may be just as good don't get recruited at all. And I felt like I fell into that category as well. You know what, I have. I talked to him twice. Um, it's, you know, it's amazing how, how you think you don't, you don't leave an impression with people. You know, you're just thinking, I'm one of 50 million people this guy's ever met. But um, when I retired in 2011, uh, his agent called me and connected me through. Now, he wasn't going to, of course, call me from his cell phone because I would be able to pass it out to all you guys. So mm -hmm. his agent called me and connected me, and he was like, man, you had an unbelievable career. And we talked for maybe 15, 20 minutes on the phone. I did wear a headband a little bit, but you know why I wore a headband? Because there wasn't a barber shop in Russia. And I couldn't cut my own hair, and I knew my mom was going to see me on TV, and she was going to say, why don't you cut your own hair? So I just wore a headband. You wear an arm sleeve? I wasn't the pretty boy type, man. I didn't wear the arm sleeve. You know how you kids are. You wear all this stuff and then can't play. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like, let me work first, and then I'll go get the, the cool stuff second. Um, you asked a lot of great questions, though. You know what? Um, I had my own shoe made in Russia by K1X. Um, it's like a street ball, street ball, street gear type of thing. Um, their, what is it? Their headquarters is in Germany, and one of their main people is in Russia. And when we won the European Championship, they made a shoe for me. So I still had the shoe. It was pretty cool. Well, I actually gave the shoes to my dad, so it was pretty cool. That's sweet. All right, guys. Well, hey, let's give uh, Jared a round of applause. <laughs> this is, uh